So well, let's jump now to the next game with the young phenom, Magnus Carlsen, our number one player in the world, playing this position, and against um, Francisco Valle Pons, who won his game, won a game finally against the tournament leader, and must have been feeling very good about himself coming into this game. But of course, Magnus is known as the comeback kid. I mean, this guy does not play around. He is ultra aggressive. And whenever he's not doing well in a tournament, look out. He reminds me in some ways of Gary Kasparov whenever he was losing in a tournament. Or, or whenever he lost the game. For, forgive me, Gary, for saying losing. Uh, I meant lost the game. I mean, this guy was very rarely ever losing in tournaments. He's always had the lead, it seems, from day one. But Magnus is the kind of player who will think, yeah, you know, I, I didn't start off so well, but watch out. And I hate to be the player facing him after he has done, after he's coming off a loss or a slow start. Because he just has that ability to heat up, to shake off the past, and keep it going. And so, very impressive player is Magnus in that regard. This game, you know... It, it was a kind of a freaky game, to tell you the truth. I mean, the game went along in, in a way that I didn't, I'm, I was really surprised by. And let's just take a look at it. Uh, first of all, this ultra solid variation with E3 and, you know, not going into any wide lines. And this move, Bishop to F5, this is the move that, you know, you want to play when the player doesn't go for the, the crazy chess uh, in the lines that go with uh, with knight c3 and bishop g5. You know, this solid e3 move, I mean, even queen c2 could have prevented the move bishop f5. But e3 says, I have no pretensions. I'm just going to play chess. And so naturally black says, okay, so I'll get my bishop out. You know, no big deal. So after knight to c3, e6. And now knight to h4, attacking the bishop. But the bishop, because of the pawn structure, as you can see here, pawn on e 6, d5, and c6. This bishop is not the happiest piece based on this pawn structure anyway, so the bishop dropped into this e4 square and said, I don't mind being traded off for a knight. You know, what do you want to do? So white first said, all right, put your bishop back there. I'll, I have another knight I can trade off for in a minute. And now I'm going to move queen to b6, exploiting the removal of the bishop on that side of the board. And so queen to b, b3, attacking this pawn on b7, that is, you know, the bishop left. So if the bishop leaves over c8, often this pawn is a weakness. But black has a simple response to that, queen to b6. And now we see knight takes and pawn takes, and now bishop to d2. I got to tell you, when, for these kind of positions is black, I, man, I really hate. I really hate when I have to deal with white just like, you know, I got a little space. I have the two bishops. Yeah, I'm just going to massage and try this and try that, and let's see what happens. But on a professional level, it's really useful to have this as as black if you know how to play really solidly. I know some players who love playing this as black. I just love it. Like, yeah, so I'm solid. Come get me. What, what you got? I'm, I'm a good player. You know, you're not just going to beat me. And uh, obviously, black, there's nothing real wrong with black's position here. It's just a question of who's going to play better in the next several moves. So... Bishop to d6 with a little KG tactic, of course. If you extend with c5 here, then just trade off queens and there's no fork. So no big deal. The bishop will leave after this. So after h, so after bishop to d6, the pawn on h2 is under attack. And this move h3 just says, well, if you play bishop to g3 check, you know, no big deal. I'm, I'm just going to move my king. It's... It's not the worst prime in the world. It's not like I'm getting mated or anything. I can move here or even move the king up to e2 if you wanted to. Uh, I'd move to d1 because I don't want to see something like queen a6 after king e2. So no worries there. So knight bd7, castle's queen side, trade, trade, and a6. And the issue here, folks, is whether or not these this white square bishop will ever come to life and prove something about the position. White has the two bishops, and really that's pretty much it. I mean, a little bit of space, to be sure, but it's just the two bishops. And, and what are the two bishops 
going to do in the long run. But with that ultra solid black structure, you just get the feeling like, you know, nothing. Like, how are you going to win this position? So now after a6, we see the move king to c2. And it's going to be some quiet play for a while. Knight to h5, of course, threatening to go into g3. And bishop to d3. And now knight g3. And now you felt like, hey, black has a nice strong square for his knight. Nothing can be wrong with his position. While the danger is always with the two bishops after rook h e1 castled, the danger is that this move could happen. e4 opening up the game, or at least attempting to open up the game, pressuring this pawn naturally on the square d5 that really cannot be defended directly because the only thing that can defend it is a knight now, something like knight f6 or knight b6, but you'll get hit with a fork on either line. Either way you play, obviously, the move c5 shows up. So that means you have to make this trade happen on e4, takes, takes, in order not to lose a pawn, and now the move c5. And here's where you start to feel like maybe there's a little tickler sensation, maybe something's going on, is it or isn't it? But this move c5 is meant to get the e5 square for black, so... The move d5 is pretty much forced, otherwise black would take himself. So d5, and white does have some space. And this is the great thing about Magnus. You know, He just keeps making moves and slow move after slow move to add pressure to the position. And now this pawn on d5, not, not only is it about space, I mean, it, that's a pass pawn. That's something you're going to have to deal with for the rest of the game. And those two bishops were what it's worth. Again, that bishop on d3 is not a star, but it was able to make this idea of e4 come alive and now d5 come alive and black's going to have to to do something to deal with this kind of position he played rook to e8 and now knight a2 today was the day of knights in my opinion i mean the knights got their say we'll see in the last game that nakamura plays how the knights danced and danced and danced and we saw just in this previous game we went over where Anan played this move knight to b8. And now we see this move knight to a2. And again, an interesting knight move. Maybe not something you see right away. You might have thought knight to e2, maybe get rid of that knight that's on g3. But no, knight a2. Let's take a look. He's looking at ideas like b4 right now to get some some exchanges uh, so that he can then take and then play his other pawn to b4, removing his double pawn. So nice little knight maneuver there. So takes, takes, and now the knight drops back to f5. And now b4 happens. Knight d4 check. King in the cubby hole. Knight to b3. And that knight, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, was just on g3. And now it's sitting on b3. You couldn't even guess that that would have happened in just a few moves. So again, knight maneuvers are happening, trying to get this bishop away, uh, this dark squid bishop, which is indeed a valuable bishop for black, uh, to try to acquire, but no, bishop c3, thank you very much, takes, and now knight takes, and the move, bishop to e5, looking to trade, and then the drop back, knight to a2, nice little move, and now bishop takes, and knight takes, and knight to c5, Quick little trade here, and now bishop to c2. Now we have to remember, we have to remember that in this situation, white still has the pass d pawn. This is what the game is really about right now, the pass d pawn. Black looks real active, and I mean, after a move like rook to e3, you know, you, you've got to feel like black's doing well here. Like, what's the problem? But knights need stable squares. Knights need longevity and stable squares and after king a2 suddenly this knight can't stay here so i have to back up it is threatening to take on c4 now rook to d4 and slowly white is pushing black backwards and this is where the game gets very exciting he now plays the move rook to g3 and after knight to e4 Rook takes and rook to d2. Now, talk about high level chess in this moment. I mean, 
This is why this kid is so powerful. What an idea. I mean, just, just the idea itself. Because now after Knight takes, Knight takes, suddenly the B4 move is coming. And it's like a shock. The Knight is trapped. Like, how did you figure on this idea? And in fact, the Knight is not... I mean, there's just nothing to do. The only thing you can do now is bail. So this is really like one of those shocking things where it's almost like a chess study. Did he see this coming all the way through? Yeah, I, I think he did. After this idea, he's looking to play this nice little move, B4, and after Rook to G3, Knight to E4. Now, of course, Black could have traded, but he would have been left with this horrible Knight anyway, and the Bishop and the, the, you know, the Pawn on G2 would have been defended. You know, right here after knight takes and uh, bishop takes, or even, yeah, bishop takes. I was going to say rook takes, but why bother? And again, this knight is just a terrible piece. Just beautifully understood by Carlson. Just beautifully understood. And you wouldn't have expected it. It's just so unexpected coming out of the position. And when black was looking so active suddenly, and now this happens. So knight to e4. Rook takes on g2, and now Rook dropping back, and takes, takes, and now there's knight on a5. You know, we, we're told as beginners not to put our knights on the rim, but of course, you know, when you're a strong player, you know you can do this and get away with it a lot, but now suddenly here comes this move. b4 is going to trap the piece. Now, because he had a pawn for it, he's not as worried, but, you know, he, he had to think maybe I have some drawing chances here by giving up this knight and somehow liquidating off, like, here comes the phenom again, knight to e4, and now it's going to be a bishop against these pieces. I think that the end game he must have analyzed very deeply after knight takes, instead of playing his move, knight takes b7, he analyzed this move, knight takes e4 takes, and then pawn takes on c4, and just looked at it and said, here comes the king, you know, this, my pawn's going to die, no question about it. And Weiss is going to be left with a pass pawn. And there's no way to really make these pawns do anything on this side of the board. So what are you going to do? I mean, it, this king's just going to march up into the position, rip off this pawn. This bishop's going to guard everybody, and you're just going to be left uh, suffering. So instead of doing that, he dropped his knight back. But after the move c5, f5, c6... He got a similar position, but these two connected pass pawns, unfortunately, were not going anywhere. After king over, king up, a5, king to c3, and now a4, bishop drops back, and a bishop just in a very healthy way guards this position. You can't make any real progress. Now the bishop, either pawn had pushed, his bishop move was on tap. And the bishop's just going to guard, and he's just going to wait him out. G5, king d4, king d6, bishop d1. And those pawns are not going anywhere. The move a3 can be answered by bishop to b3, and everything's shut down, and black will eventually face Zugzwang. Be forced back, king enter, game over. Beautiful idea by Carlson. Very deep idea of seeing just how the knight that was on g3 imagine traveled all the way across the board to b3 ended up on a5 and then found itself lost just incredibly deep and the way he did it with knight e4 and rook to d2 i mean this kid's good <laughs> okay i'm not the first person to say and i must be a genius for saying the kid knows how to play but very deep, deep chess on the part of the young player. And uh, what you know, what can you say? The, the kid played some high-level chess and, and won a game in deserving style.